Real Life Peter Griffin, and you're listening to the Droids Canada Podcast. <laughs> David Faustino. Hello, this is Andrew Chalmers, the writer and doctor in Doctor Who, Dark Journey. This is Dr. Steve-o. Uh, everybody, this is the Cavernator. This is Inspector Gadget. Hey, what's cracking, y'all? It's your boy, J-Rock. Good evening, folks. This is James Duval. This is Jeremy Taggart. This is Kim Possible. I'm Chris Holden-Reed. Hey, this is Pat Mastriani from Degrassi. <laughs> this is the evil Dr. Bad Vibes. Again, this is Messy Bear. And this is more from X-Men. Hey, this is Andrew Gazess. This is Sean Gunn. Hi, this is Robert Carradine. It's Tammy Stronach from The NeverEnding Story. Hey, it's Zach Callison. Hey, I'm DJ Jenny Rod. And I'm Neil Young. I'm Commander Shepard. Ralph Garman here. You're listening to Droids Canada. You've made an excellent choice. You have chosen wisely. Warning. Listener discretion is advised. Oh, that means there's a lot of fucking swearing. Hello. <laughs> Alright, here we are. We're in Philadelphia, Greater Philadelphia Comic Con and Expo. Um, I have been blessed with the opportunity to have a nice sit down, to be able to talk craft, to talk with Keon Young. How are you doing today? Good, very good. Excellent, good. excellent. Enjoying Philadelphia so far? Uh, I've seen the hotel and I've seen here, and that's about it. <laughs> now I'm going to get right into it with you. I can't so. wait to get a cheesesteak sandwich. Somebody get me a cheesesteak sandwich, please. Um, okay, okay, so. I work in Niagara Falls, and I run a restaurant in Niagara Falls, and I have had people from Philly come in, and they have said there are all these different, the touristy uh, Philly cheesesteak places. Don't talk, don't go to any of those. You go to a place called Steve's, Steve Steaks. Okay. That came from a Philly guy who said that he, they're known for two things, <laughs> cheesesteaks and being jerks. Okay. And I'm a jerk, and you got to go to Steve's. <laughs> so Steve's is the way to go. That's a good recommendation. Now, that being said, um, 244 listed Internet Movie Database titles I have seen you in. Everything from soap opera to, um, to voice acting to, you know, feature films. Now, you've done so many different genres. What is your secret to be able to, to, be able to do all of those? Um, it's tenacity. It's to keep on doing what you want to do in life. Um, first, you've got to figure out what you want. Because most people just have this kind of dream, oh, I want to be famous, or I want to be rich, or I want to be loved. But you got to find out the actual craft and that you have a passion for, or a thing that you have a passion for, and commit yourself totally to it. And never let anybody tell you uh, that you can't do it. Did hold you up. have... Can you hold up? Hi, is he part of you? No. What are you here for? The panel? Well, you know, nobody's here, so pull up a chair. Pull up a chair. Come on, sit with us. you can listen to me talk, and then you can ask me <laughs> questions afterwards. Because we're talking about my career. Yeah. Talking about you. the craft, how things are done. And, um, yeah, so we were, we were getting into um, uh, the, the craft and the, all the different types of genres that you have been in and okay. how you're able to go across every single one of those genres and have success, continued success doing that. Yes. Now, what, what's your secret to being able to do that? Well, like I said, you have to be tenacious. When I came out to L.A. in, let's say, 65, uh, we were pretty limited. There was no diversity, you know. Mm -hmm. Diversity was a short person, <laughs> you know. I was told by a group of people in the business at that time. Um, there were, I don't, re, I don't know if you recall, during like the 40s, during the war, they did a bunch of <clears throat> war movies and they hired a bunch of Chinese actors like Philip Bond, Ki Luke, uh, Benson uh, Fong, Victor Sin Young. These, these are the guys did all the Charlie Chan stuff and all, all those stuff. And so they were kind of like geared for one type of uh, uh, service to the industry. They played the Chinaman, the Chink, the Jap. So it's those guys who told me, hey, you know what? Get out of town because this town is rough. You, nobody's going to give you anything. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to give you a job. Nobody's going to want you. So I said to myself, 
I'm going to make them want me. I'm going to make them have to have me and rely on the goodness of people that when they see something of quality, it doesn't matter what you are or what you do, that they will embrace you. And I kind of believed that because I had some mentors at that time. I don't know if you remember a guy named Mako. No, I don't. I don't. Okay, Mako was nominated for an Academy Award, I believe in the early, mid-60s, mm -hmm. for Sand Pebbles. He was the voice of Aku in Samurai Jack. Okay. He was the voice of Uncle in Avatar. But he was a great actor. And he mentored me. And he was the one who told me, learn your craft. Because mm -hmm. once you learn your craft, they can't deny you that. So with that, with you know, people who are listening out there who, who do want to get involved with the craft, now how would you say, what would you say is the best advice for someone to learn that craft? Well, you have to learn all the sciences that uh, surround that craft. Mm -hmm. For example, like I went to learn music, classical music, like how to play an instrument, so I could learn how to read music. Because that's one part of literature that a lot of people can't read. Mm -hmm. I can, can pick up a score and I can read it. <clears throat> because of that, I learned tonality. I learned rhythm. And the different history of music. Mm -hmm. Classical, romantic, neoclassical, and ethnic. So I could recreate sounds in an instrument it would go into my body, and eventually it would go into my vocal ability. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, I learned craft. And, and, you know, I studied languages. I went to Berlitz. I studied Asian languages. I learned how to s sing opera. I studied German songs, Lieder, and I can sing German songs, and uh, uh, like Mozart, and uh, uh, French. And Italian, because Italian was a, music was a great part of opera. Mm -hmm. So what happens is when you, once you learn the different sciences, and I, I went to, I, I took ballet, studied gymnastics. Once you learn all these things, you become a person with certain abilities. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> Hollywood is a very competitive place. And you better have all this craft in, the, in your pocket. Mm -hmm. to be able to, 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 to compete. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I see with the explosion of reality <laughs> television that's been going on, it kind of creates this, oh, I can do this. I can be a star. I can do this because of people showing up. And, and from what you're telling to me, like, please correct me if I'm wrong, but that seems to be almost the opposite of what working on the craft is all about. Well, you know, like in everything, let's say you're a chef. For somebody to make something very simple and easy is very hard, you know? Mm -hmm. some, I mean, yeah, anybody can slap together a McDonald's or a Wendy's burger, but to make something with real depth, simplicity, you don't see somebody sweating and working hard. It's a very simple process, but it's in order to get to that simplicity, you have to have a lot of work behind it. Mm -hmm. The work behind making it simple makes it simply amazing. Yeah, for example, like boxing, you know, it can end in one round. You know, it can end in the first round. But the amount of training that you had to get to that period is enormous. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, same with rowing. I have a daughter who rows. Yeah. And that's the same. It's train, 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 train for five minutes of all out. <laughs> of full, all, full all out. Right. Mm -hmm. And okay. you make it simple, look simple and easy, and that's why people, everybody thinks they can do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they it does. Want, they don't know that process, and the process is more important to us than the performance. Because mm -hmm. if you ask me, you know, okay, what performance, what character is your best? I keep thinking. You know, when I go to bed at night after a performance, I always think, what could I have done to make it better? Mm -hmm. What? At that moment, I wasn't that good. Or at that moment, I should have done that. So I'm never satisfied, you know. Mm -hmm. 
I'm always trying to reach that point of white light where you feel really satisfied. An athlete who is participating in an event and wins, but still wants to improve themselves. Right, very, very right. similar. What can I do to enhance what I have done even more what, to what become the I best? What have done to be better? Mm -hmm. So uh, once you realize that you're competing with yourself instead of other people, I think you'll reach a pinnacle of awareness and confidence and ability in yourself to compete. Mm -hmm. And believe me, confidence is a big part of our industry if you know anything about it. Yeah, see, I'm uh, completely green with the industry and don't know anything about it. And this is a, an amazing talk that you're having, just kind of letting me in to know, you know, kind of how it is and how things go. Yeah. Now, uh, what were the biggest hardships that you felt you have faced uh, from start mm -hmm. to now, be it, you know, being such a long career? Um, not, wait, not being good enough. That was really hard. Mm -hmm. um, not being accepted by a person or by society. Uh, hard. It's all hard. It's hard for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, my father went to work every day, you know, and he ended up, um, he, he had his own store, and he ended up you know, pretty much counting his change at the end of the day mm -hmm. you know yeah doing what you have to do to make to to get by right mm -hmm. so um <clears throat> you know what is hard i don't know you know I, I i i live a pretty great life i've traveled all over the world i've worked with the greatest people mm -hmm. Do you find that in today's day and age with, you know, awareness is a little bit more that those, that it's a little bit easier for you now or, you know, as compared to how it was possibly back in the 60s and 70s? Easier for me? No, I, I, I worry about the youth or the young people coming up mm -hmm. because uh, in my day, craft was very important. If you look at the old movies, like from the film noir, like from the 40s and 50s, like some of the great writers were writing. They had hired some of the great uh, literature uh, people, you know, like Tennessee Williams, like uh, William Faulkner. Mm -hmm. They were hiring Dasho Hammett. They were hiring these guys to write scripts for movies. Mm -hmm. And the actors who were acting in these things had to be able to handle it. Mm -hmm. They studied doing theater all across the country. Mm -hmm. They went to repertory com uh, companies. I was watching a, a 19, something from 1955, the old Alfred Hitchcock Presents, and I saw an actor named Ralph Meeker, and I looked at his bio, and he had done theater, radio, he had been on Broadway, and I could tell by the, his performance he was a trained person. Mm -hmm. So now training doesn't really does it really exist anymore. Well, it exists, but it it, it it's so seldom rewarded. Mm -hmm. It's so seldom rewarded that it's not like if you're a great doctor or a great lawyer or a competent one. Uh, it, 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 you know, it's for for a performer. Sometimes you're rewarded more with like. Uh, the visual aspect with how good you look. And that's what's so sad because once you stop looking good, you're done. Each year that goes <laughs> each year that goes by, it's like, oh that changed. That's different. That's different. <laughs> but you're done, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's like, but competent craftspeople can survive. And you ask me how what is my I don't know if this is a proper conversation, but you ask me how I've been able to do all this work mm -hmm. because I have the craft. And I have the confidence because I have the craft. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not scared of nothing. I don't care. I'll work with Al Pacino and Chris Walken and Alan Alda in a scene. Mm -hmm. I come to the set. And I said, this is my scene. <laughs> you know? That's a, that's a, great, a great viewpoint to have on that. That's, uh, that's amazing. <laughs> now. And I loved Al. I love Al. Uh, there's a movie called, uh, what was the name of the movie? It was with Al. It was recently. I can't even think of that. Uh, Al Pacino? Yeah. 
Uh, Al Pacino, Chris Walken, and Al and all, they played old gangsters. Oh, God. Um, Stan, Stan? It's going to bug me now. I know which one you're talking yeah, about. I okay. do. I do. <clears throat> was De Niro wasn't in that. Stand Up Guys. Stand, Stand Up Guys. guys. Stand Up Guys. Mm-hmm. So I come in, and there's Al, there's Chris Walken, and there's Al and Alda. And those are tremendous actors, if you know. Mm-hmm. So you got to be able to duke it out with them. You know, it's like getting in the ring with Mike Tyson, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, but you go in with your confidence and with your training and with the craft that you have, and you go in to own it. Well, one thing you have to remember is that there are craftspeople that can play all kinds of characters, you know, and like voice people, like voice actors. There's some wonderful people like Frank Welker, people uh, uh, like him who can do all kinds of wonderful voices because he has a craft but there's one thing from my point of view that I can do better than anybody in this world and that is be Keone Young Mm -hmm. you know I might be Keone Young with you know some age or I might be the funny Keone but nobody can do me better than me Mm -hmm. so when you're working with Pacino you're not feared about having to be on the level of Pacino he has to fear about being on the level with you because you know he cannot do you better than you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so could you say that in the roles that you have done, you have put pieces of you into all of those roles? Oh, every one. Mm-hmm. And what do, you, what do you mean by you? I put my father, my uncle, mm-hmm. my mentor, my best friends. Mm-hmm. Your I, daily experiences. Yeah, people say, oh, that scene was an iconic scene. Let's say in Mr. Uh, Deadwood, Mr. Wu. That's, that was... That was that was not, that was, uh, nobody could have done that better than me because that was me. Mm-hmm. That was my grandfather when he first came to this country. I know him. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows him like I know him, you know, or like uh, in uh, Dude, Where's My Car? You know, that scene where they go, dude, sweet, dude, sweet, and I'm yeah. a Chinese tailor. That was a Chinese guy down the street you know, that I grew up mm-hmm. with. So you take some you take some uh, some roles and some scenes and think, in my life I have done this. This is what I can and put works. into that, and then yeah, that works. You can with be you. that specific and interest, and you can pluck these things out, and people watch it and they go, "Man, that was that was un- that was interesting. That scene was." It. But it's no, it's because it's you, it's the real you, mm-hmm. not what you think they want to see but what you think they should see. Mm-hmm. That, is, that, is, that is very amazing. That's so enlightening. I actually have like probably about 15 different cue cards of questions that I was prepping yeah. for this, for this sit-down that I have with you and have not even touched on a single <laughs> one of them. At this point now, I don't even want to look at them anymore because it's, it's very enlightening for me to be able to, to you know, hear these and hear the stories and hear the things with this. Now, um, if I could ask, what would be the number one fondest memory that you have on set like maybe not necessarily to do with acting to do with the role but like a great situation like that just kind of really really made you happy on set um okay like happiness is relative Mm -hmm. okay don't ask a performer about happiness because like they can give you 18 stories of that happiness of how depressing it was Mm -hmm. but but or, or most memorable. Let me tell you. Memorable? Mm-hmm. Okay, there's one. I'll tell you one. I was on the set. I was doing the remake of Get Smart with Don, Get Smart with Don Adams. And mm-hmm. what's her name that played the, uh, played the woman? The, huh? She was a woman. No, Get Smart? In the, the movie no, no. The the, see, these young people, they don't, the, the, the black and white TV show. It was, uh, she played Agent, the, yeah, what was her name? Anyway, with Don, Don uh, Adams, mm-hmm. it was a TV show, and I was working with her, and we were in the middle of the scene, okay? A light that wasn't anchored properly fell, and it whacked me on the side of the head, and everybody ran to her and said, are you okay? Are you okay? <laughs> no, I was like on the ground going like, she didn't get hit, it was me that got hit. And I realized then where I was in the hierarchy. Where you're on the pecking order. <laughs> of the business. I said, oh, this is what it is. Mm-hmm. And I was enlightened. 
So when you say happiness, it's all relative, right? Mm -hmm. I went home and I thought, this is what they think of me. And I will show them what I really am. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that, that has been kind of like my philosophy, you know, that you might think that of me. And this is what we think of every, the other or the other person or the else. But then you have to show them what your metal is made of. Mm -hmm. You have to show them, uh, you know, that you are worth as much as anything. Mm -hmm. it, and, and craft comes into play. Excellent. I see we have some, uh, some people over here. If you guys have any questions, just give a shout out and... Uh this is kind of a nice informal <laughs> chat that we're all having here. So if you do want to know anything, yeah, just, just shoot away. Uh, so for your role in the Deadwood movie, like that's coming up, supposedly. Uh, do you have... Okay. So for your role in the Deadwood movie, um, now that like time has passed from the original setting to the yeah. new, uh, is there any going to be something different that you wish you could you could be part of now that like the it, like the new setting takes place after some advancement from being like a you know like a Chinaman worker to kind of like a business owner and beyond that okay let me tell you something when I met David Milch who was the creator of Deadwood I told him and this is like I'm from Hawaii okay so the terminology I use might not be correct but this is the terminology we use I said listen man Asian, Chinese, Chinese people were considered as always portrayed as effeminate, always portrayed as non-threatening, passive. I said, do you know we built your railroad? You know, I see we were men. We had balls and we love women, but they always portrayed us as these non-sexual bugs insects not worthy of manhood i said whatever you do man make mr wu he can be a chinaman a chink a gook but you got to make him a man gook you got to make him walk with balls in his legs you know they went huh that's interesting so they went and did research i gave them books to read and they said oh okay so that's why i have this whole thing if you know the show with swedgen you know about killing people and about stealing and building a culture and peoples, building business and how business was built in America. Because if you know the history of America, America was not built by being nice, you know? They stole the land that they wanted their businesses to prosper on. They killed people. And I wanted to be a part of that history. And I wanted to make sure that people understood that Chinamen were as complex as anybody to build this country. So uh, nobody has really touched upon <coughs> the psyche of what Wu is. They love the relationship between Wu and Swearingen. But I hope that they get underneath in the subtext that we were men who stopped at nothing but building a future for this country. And the way we did it, we did it by any means necessary. So today, you know, I don't want to have these false notions about crazy rich Asians or Sandra Oh and Killing Eve. We live in communities. We live in a certain culture of determination and respect. But yet on the other side, we have hate, we have discrimination, and we and have prejudice that we, we are also complicit in. And that is our nature. That we're not these sweet little Asians that want to make nice, that we will kill you in order to get what we want. And I will kill you if you threaten my family. <laughs> I, I'm capable of that, as we all are, I think. You know, if we want to preserve our life, our peoples, our culture, our future, 
that we have a certain amount of integrity. So I hope that that is what I could have portrayed in Mr. Wu. Does that make sense? Huh? Because <laughs> you know your father, right? You know your mother, right? They kill for you. Right? They die for you. They work hard for you. And that's what I wanted to come across. That we not deserve your love. We demand your love. I don't even know what I can say after that. <laughs> that, that that's, that's pretty deep. That is pretty deep. Anyone else have any questions? So I'm a big fan of the uh, Avatar The Last Airbender series where you played uh, Zhang Zhang, kind of this magic kung fu Colonel Kurtz character. Uh, just wondering about uh, your experience doing that and what you brought to that. Well, let me tell you, Hollywood had changed from those days from G.I. Joe got a little more civilized <laughs> and uh, it was a it, it was a uh, kind of like a civilized kind of like gathering of people who were just interested in doing some kind of uh, science kind of I don't want to say science fiction but some kind of like adventure together uh, yeah fantasy and the world had turned towards that. You know, I come from, I don't know if you know Ray Harryhausen and those, those guys. Um, yeah, and from, remember, um, like, the, was it Sinbad with the Cyclops? And from those days where um, you didn't have CGI, you had people manipulating the, <coughs> the, the monsters and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I come from, but in, in those days, <coughs> it was pretty cold-blooded it was violent it was like so like doing avatar was kind of like a prettification of like adventure you know made more palatable for a more civilized people so it was nice it was fine i enjoyed it they sent my checks to the right place <laughs> and then i went on my crazy life <laughs> well, it sounds like it's been an amazing, crazy life that you've had. Uh, oh, it's been wonderful, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the best ways to tell a lie is to be honest about yourself, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the easiest, is to tell the truth about that lie. And like I tell my son, you know, I say, why do you make all these machinations about this stuff? This is because I don't want them to be mad at me. I let them be mad at you. Because one thing you cannot hide and one thing you don't have to hide is tell the truth. And people will love you for telling the truth. Anyone else? Any, uh, any last questions for uh... one more? You got it. So you mentioned that your son would like watch what you're doing and kind of, you know, get feedback from the kind of roles you're taking. What's it like where, you know, you're, you'd be, he'd be watching a TV show or an old cartoon and it's like, is that my dad? Like, in the voice or as a role popping in, doing a scene and leaving? What's that like? Like, my son, you mean? Yeah, what? like, what's it like having uh, your son kind of react to you appearing in your, your, your uh, roles? Oh, well. He, you know, my son thinks I'm not with it. <laughs> You know, because I don't know who Boba Fett is. You know, <laughs> it's like, you don't know Boba Fett? He's like, he goes, I go, no, it don't, you know. I mean, because that's not my priorities in life. My priority in life is like, why is Boba Fett? You know, why is he? And not what is he, you know. So... <clears throat> My son sees me as a figment of his imagination. Sort of, like, you know. Yeah, he's that, but he's this, you know. You know what I mean? But uh, I guess it's all relationships of child to the parent. You know, what you see yourself as and what he sees you as is two different things. And, you know, I love that. I love that. And... Uh, 
I understand it because that's the way I looked at my dad, you know. I thought my dad was a wonderful, great, smart of all men. But now that I know what it's like, I realize how a failure he was. Huh? Does that give you a question in your mind? Yeah, I realize that he did not reach his goals in life and that he was uh, saddened because of it. You know, My dad grew up in the time of Eisenhower and Rockefeller and those guys made millions and Carnegie. And he had hoped that he would one day become like that too because that was his dream. And I used to believe, oh, what a wonderful, he's a great dad, you know. But then I realized <clears throat> that society doesn't work that way. And I hope my son understands that about me someday too. And I keep trying to explain to him, that's not me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Anyone else for last questions? Then I really want to... Let me ask you a question. Are you animation fans? Why are you an animation fan? The art form. Yeah. You know, it gives a certain uh, focus to what you want to try and bring out of that light that you can't necessarily capture. Yeah. Yeah. Even with the voice performance, too, they can be more expressive and more artistic light, right? I see. So, <clears throat> I know what I try and do as an actor, as a voice actor, is I think of colors more than anything. I try and paint colors and images for people when I'm doing my voice. You know, like, like how music does. You know? Um, like if you hear the blues or you hear something uh, very religious, you know, choral religious. I try and create that for people in my vo voice and sound. You know? I try to sing the blues, you know, or sing the glory to whatever. Oh, thanks. Thank you, because that's what I want to hit you with, you know. To you, hit you with that moment of, like, the, the unmundaneness of life, you know, the rich part of life where you feel it and go, oh, man, I love that girl. Oh, man, that steak was good. <laughs> you know? So... That's what I constantly think of when I'm doing vocal work, you know. Portraying that into a voice, though, that is actually not your physical features, though. Do, right. you, find, do you find difficulty in doing that? Or does the uh, process of the animation actually, do they now, oh, I know kind of they do that a little bit more now, but do they put your facial expressions from your, your voice acting yeah, into that? You, get, you see, they come with a skeleton, and you got to put the pieces of the body on, you know, the organs. And that's why I say to actors, they say, oh, well, how can I become a voice, uh, you know, voice actor? I'm really interested in it. I go, get a girlfriend first. <laughs> go make love with somebody. Get some life experience. Get rejected, <laughs> you know. <laughs> get dumped. And then you can bring out those things in your voice. You know, once you know what it's like to be like, Man, she, what, she went with another guy. What's wrong with me? You know? Once you go through that, it, it's, it'll help you in your, in your pursuit. And it's like, uh, and when I say like nobody can be you better than you, you what well, also means that you better have that life experience. And because you can't beat life experience in a person. You can get all the life experience you want from your video and your computer and your comic book, but you have to go and live it. 
All right, then, uh, you know, we've already gotten up to close to 45 minutes here oh, chatting have? away. Sorry. Yes, we definitely have. Yeah, I hope, so uh, I hope I've sounded, you know, not, not too in, uh, incoherent. No, not whatsoever. It's ab- it was absolutely amazing. So I really want to thank you for your time. Okay. And, um, yeah, just continue doing what you're doing. Continue, you know, to me, this was a very inspiring conversation that we had. Yeah, and I hope so, because that's what I want to do. I don't, I'm done. I'm done. I've done everything I, want, I can do and wanted to do, you know. Mm-hmm. But it's the young, young people, it's the generation that come after me, they have to do something. And even if it's just wanting to see something, <clears throat> your choice of wanting to see and what you're able to see, you know, quality, depth, integrity, that's what all I can ask for, for people who watch my stuff. Mm-hmm. Demand of me true, the reality. What is real versus what is fake? Mm-hmm. And you got a little bit of real in all of that, right? Well, tell me if I'm fake, <laughs> if you don't believe me. Um, I 100% <laughs> believe cur- everything you're saying. This is the most real conversation I have had with okay. anyone who has been involved. I'm doing this for three years. Okay. The most real conversation I've had with anyone involved with show business. Okay. And it's, it's, it's very enlightening, like I said. Don't forget, I, though. I don't need any of these cue cards here. Don't forget, <laughs> though. I told you that I can lie now. <laughs> so take whatever I say with a grain of salt because I told you I know how to lie. Straight face. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sorry. everyone. Thanks, guys, for coming. I appreciate you. I love you. Take it back. Do, 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 do. Take it back. Take you back. Do 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 do. Take you back. Well, I've been told by.